I'm Tim McGowan for the Finance News Network. On today's episode of Stockwatch, we're going to take a look at Novonix, ASX code NVX, got a market cap of around $1.15 billion. Now, Stockwatch highlights compelling market opportunities and provides a unique conversation with company CEOs and our research analysts. We want you to understand the upside of our research as well as the risks. Now, Novonix is an integrated developer and supplier of high-performance materials, equipment and services for the global lithium-ion battery industry with operations in the US and Canada and sales in more than 14 countries. We're talking today to Novonix CEO, uh, Dr. Chris Burns, and Corporate Connects analyst, Di Brookman, who has put a $5.76 price target on the company, implying around 135% upside from the current share price. Chris, welcome to the network. Great, appreciate it, Tim. Now, Chris, forecasts, of course, for auto gigafactories in the US is surging to 960 gigawatt hours by 2031. And this suggests that nearly 1 million tonnes of battery grade anode material will be required to meet demand. Now, of course, some new chemistries may appear, that, but it's clear that graphite continues to be the primary input. Uh, with the task of building a US supply chain daunting, what role is Novonix playing and how are you positioning yourself to lead in this space? Tim, you're absolutely right. The, the industry has a huge challenge in front of us in building out the supply chain that's needed. And as you said, almost a million tons of uh, anode grade graphite needed by 2030, 2031, with the production today in the country being zero, essentially. And so this is a big task, but we see the private sector and the government working together to try to support the ability to build independence from an existing supply chain, which is so controlled by China and the Asian markets. And so at Novonics, we think we've positioned ourselves very well over the past several years, investing in a critical technology that was overlooked because of the hope that new technologies would come in and displace or disrupt the market. But it's becoming very clear that these new anode technologies have a much longer path to mainstream commercialization And the graphite, as you said, will be the dominant anode material for this decade and beyond. And so as one of the few companies in the United States that focused on that and are scaling our first mass production plant with an offtake with core power, this is, I think, what had the government recognize the opportunity for Novonics and help us be selected for the $150 million of grant funding under the infrastructure law that we announced last month. How will you deploy this money and what are your key focuses for the next six months? Over the next three to six months, the critical focus around the company is continuing to build out our Riverside facility that will be coming online for our first contract with Core Power that begins deliveries in 2024. And then also focusing on the new site, which will house our 2025 start of production for our 30,000 ton incremental expansion. So over the next three to six months, we hope to be announcing the site as well as breaking ground on that site for the new facility and be working very closely with the cell manufacturers and the automotive partners that we're working on to progress the qualification and sampling programs that we're working for to look at the customer base that will be taking the materials from that facility starting in 2025 and into 2026 and beyond. Can you also talk about the additional funding opportunities that are open or available for Novonix? Uh, For instance, how would you fund the development of the cathode business while still scaling the anode business? So the Inflation Reduction Act has put significant new capital into, for example, the Department of Energy's loan program office to support these types of critical materials projects. Last year, the infrastructure law, of course, was passed, which we're the recipient of who are selected for funding under. And, And there are other programs that the government is looking to use to support this industry. But also equally important to consider is the impact of that policy on the end customers in our space, for example, the automakers, the ability for them to qualify their vehicles for up to $7,500 of EV rebates for their consumers is really critical and therefore imperative for them to be sourcing Inflation Reduction Act or IRA compliant material. And as such, you're starting to see the cell manufacturers and the auto sector look upstream for how to partner and help financially support uh, their partners in their supply chain. And so this means we have options around uh, grant funding, which of course we've been successful in being selected for, federal debt through the government programs, as well as customer support 
to help finance this first uh, large facility in in the United States for our nanomaterials business. And while our cathode materials business continues to progress, we've been select, uh, successful in receiving grant funding uh, and support from the Canadian federal government for the expansion of our pilot line facility, which we just opened a few weeks ago in Nova Scotia. And as we look at the partnership programs for that, as we move to commercialization through either licensing or investing in production, we'll look at similar leverage opportunities to support those funding investments through the public sector, private sector partners, as well as any requirements from our existing investors and shareholders in the market. Thanks, Chris, for your time. We're joined today by Corporate Connect analyst uh, Di Brookman, who's writing uh, the research report. Um, Di, nice to see you in person. Thanks nice for your time. Nice to be here, Tim. Nice to be here. Now, one of the first questions uh, I'd like to ask you in regards to your research is, you know, what are some of the key drivers uh, for graphite demand? Well, I guess I'll probably start by referencing Benchmark Intelligence, which is um, a UK consultancy. Uh, they've recently come out with some new numbers for the US, whereby they're now looking for 960 gigawatt hours up from only 56 gigawatts in 2021. Um, so that's a, almost a growth of a million tonnes of graphite by the time we get out to 2031. It's very significant. Now, they're also looking within that context of the graphite. You can have natural or you can have synthetic. And of course, Navonics is all about synthetic. So they're looking at approximately 44% of that million tonnes to, to be um, ascribed to synthetic graphite. So that's 440,000 tonnes. Well, we're looking at Navonics with approximately 150,000 tonnes by the time they get out to circa 2031. Um, so that would give them a market share of about 40%, which intuitively sounds extraordinarily high, but actually we're not sure where the rest of the graphite is going to come from if we're looking at developing local supply chains in the USA. Um, and, and Di, what, what's Navonics' uh, key competitive advantage? Their probably main um, advantage is a first um, mover advantage. Uh, they'll be the first producer in the USA of commercial premium quality battery grade synthetic graphite. It sounds like a mouthful, but it's important to get that right. Um, and they'll be located in an ecosystem which is um, growing um, rapidly in Tennessee. Um, we've now got General Motors there, Ford, um, LG Chem as of the other day, um, LG uh, Solutions um, and Volkswagen of course. So there's quite a hub that's um, um, opening up and that of course allows for um, cost efficiencies. Now Di, of course in, in your Corporate Connect research you valued Navonics around uh, $5.76 which implies about 135% upside at the moment. How did you value Navonics? We used um, a terminal um, discounted cash flow using a discount rate of 8% and a growth rate of 2%. We then looked at the synthetic graphite project and um, divided it up into three phases. The first phase to 10,000 tonnes of capacity, the second phase up to 75,000 tonnes of capacity and the third phase would take you up to the 150. Um, and then we've applied different risk factors to each one of those phases. Now, obviously the first one is now fully funded and virtually fully contracted uh, and under construction, so we had an 80% uh, probability that that will, will go ahead um, as modelled. Um, the second phase we've applied 60%. Um, and because funding still isn't that clear, albeit we've got some grants on the table and the expectation is we'll get some, some low cost loans from the US government. Um, and then also recycled equity from the first 10 KT, that's very important. Surplus cash is generated, it'll be re reinvested into the business as equity. And the third phase, we only applied a 20% probability of, of going ahead. So we've only used 0.2 times the NPV8 that we've calculated. Now there are obviously other aspects of the valuation that have been considered and one is the cathode business which is quite exciting that's uh, due to commission before the end of this year. Um, there's not much information out there at the moment so the best that we could do uh, was in line with our initiation um, which was to take the market cap of Nano One Technologies which we have done. So we think that that's conservative because they're clearly they've got some proprietary technology, um, a dry synthesis uh, technology which should um, give them a, an additional competitive advantage in that space. And then the microgrid business, uh, we currently model as a free option. So, so Di, how, how do you bring together the, the execution risk of Navonics and the catalysts into your valuation? 
Thanks for asking that question. This is important for how um, our valuation methodology works. We attach the valuation to the execution of key catalysts. So as um, a major announcement is made, the project would be de-risked very much like how, a, how it might be perceived in the real world with bankers and off-takers. It's all about trying to mitigate, mitigate the risk. So we've got a big um, catalyst coming up potentially before the end of the year, which is the securing of contracts for the 30,000 tonnes, which um, is looking for um, a new site. And uh, also the execution of a new site, like the location of that new site coming up before the end of the year. And then we've got a commissioning of the cathode line in Canada. And, and Di, part of you've Part of your valuation, what are some of the funding catalysts that uh, are ahead of Novonics? Well, actually, this is quite important because we're using quite conservative um, forecasts for synthetic price. We're using uh, $9 per kilo or $9,000 per tonne US um, going out to 2030 before we lower it. So um, what is the upside? Well, there's some 301 tariffs uh, which are up for review, uh, expected by the 1st of January, which is... Currently, there are some 25% tariffs on product coming from China to the US, but graphite and synthetic graphite have been exempted from those tariffs. So it'll be interesting to see whether they're reinstated within, those, within that tariff system. If so, then that's equal to a US $2.50 um, increase over the spot price at the moment, which is running at $10, $10 per kilo. There are also some tax credits which uh, the US government has indicated um, are forthcoming to the industry. That's worth approximately US $6 a kilo. Um, but that will be spread amongst the chain, so it's not entirely clear how much will end up with Novonics at the moment. But what it does do is increase the probability that we're probably going to be looking at something in the order of $12 per kilo or $12,000 per tonne. We're currently using nine. So we think we're being conservative. Um, there's upside to come. Uh, we'll see how that unfolds. Ty Brookman, thanks for your time. Thanks, Tim.